So when you see the name Adams in this probable cause affidavit or so, this Tiffany Mikkel or Mikkel Adams, right? That's the grandmother of Veronica's children. Then we've got Tad Bird Cullum, the boyfriend of the grandmother. And then the friends, Carl Twombly and Cora Twombly. All right? Okay, so let me just quickly check that everything is fine. Are we good? <laughs> Sound good. Documents and mugshot time. You know who's who now. If you have been following this case with me and you have seen, uh, especially yesterday's presentation time and deep dive, you're going to have a good visual. Even of the map time, we did some of that. So visualize as we read, okay? All right, so affidavit of probable cause for arrest warrant. Now they say April 12th of 2024 there. I'm going to read everything because it's only uh, three pages long for the PCA. The whole document is seven pages long, okay? All right, so um, talks to animals. Thank you so much. Now it says, affidavit of probable cause for arrest warrant. The undersigned of lawful age being first duly sworn upon oath deposes and states as follows. I'm Special Agent Jason Ott of the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. I have been a law enforcement officer in the states of Kansas and Oklahoma for approximately 27 years. Damn, okay. And served in the capacity of an investigator for over 20 years. I have read and prepared certain official investigative reports and statements of witnesses regarding the above-named defendant and from these statements and reports it appears as follows. Are we ready? On Saturday, March 30th, 2024, the Texas County Sheriff's Office requested Oklahoma State Bureau Investi of Investigation, the OSBI, Investigative Services, with the suspicious disappearance of Veronica Butler, 27, and Jillian Kelly, 39, from rural Texas County after their vehicle was found abandoned near Highway 95 and Road L, south of Elkhart, KS. Butler and Kelly, I guess that's Kansas, right? Butler and Kelly were traveling from Oklahoma. Uh, no, 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 no. They were traveling to Oklahoma from Hugerton, Kansas. Okay? So they say, interviews were conducted related to their disappearance, and it was discovered that Butler, so Veronica Butler, was in a problematic custody battle with Tiffany Adams for the custody of Butler's two children. So there they say it loud and clear. It's not really, it wasn't a battle between Veronica and her ex, who's that uh, Wrangler guy. That's the guy's name, Wrangler, right? <laughs> Which is Tiffany Adams' son, the father of the two children. No, no, it's, it's a custody battle between Tiffany Adams, the grandmother, and Veronica, right? So, the father of those children, they say was Wrangler Rickman, but I mean, is, <laughs> is, he's, he's in rehab. I wonder if he, he's heard about this, I don't know, because it's apparently like, wouldn't have his phone, no contact, I mean, he's going to get a big fright when he hears about all this, <laughs> right? If he doesn't know, I'm sure by now he would have been contacted, right? Okay, so they said the father of those children was Wrangler Rickman, Adam's son. Butler's visitation with her children was court ordered to be supervised every Saturday. Adams had a particular person that she preferred to supervise those visitations. So Adams, as in the grandmother, had a particular person that she wanted to supervise those visitations. And that was Cheryl Brune or Brunet. Now, again, that I would have normally redacted, but later they switched to only using a surname. So it'll get really confusing. <laughs> you know, it will really be like if I had to redact that, I'll be like, what? We'll get lost. So the court ordered Adams to pay Brune to supervise visits. Okay, so Adams, Tiffany Adams, the grandmother, had to pay the Cheryl lady to supervise visits if that's who she wanted to be present. Otherwise, Veronica Butler was to choose and pay for the person to supervise. Adams said that Brune was unavailable. So Adams, Tiffany Adams, said that her choice, okay, of person was unavailable to supervise the visitation on March 30th of 2024. So Butler was required to arrange the supervision with one of her three approved individuals. See, now that's different because we heard about four approved individuals. Now they clarify it's three. You know, with every case, they say, uh, you know, the public knows five to ten law enforcement. They tell us the public knows five to ten percent of what's really going on in a case. Right. But then when the PCA comes out, uh, Peter Tragos, the lawyer, no, told us once, well, then maybe, you know, about 40 percent, 40 to 50 percent of everything that's going on in the case. So we're learning some more details here now, um, but obviously it's not everything yet. Uh, thank, thanks, Janie, for being a member for 27 months. Oh, my goodness. So they say, now Butler was to choose and pay for the person to supervise. Adam said that her one wasn't available, so Butler was required to arrange the supervision with one of her three approved individuals. Butler contacted 
Kelly, that's Julian Kelly, the other victim, of Hugerton, Kansas, and planned to have her supervise the visit. Butler told family members that she was going to pick up her children from Adams, from that grandmother, Tiffany Adams, at 1000 hours, so 10 o'clock in the morning, at Four Corners. See, so Veronica told her family members she was going to that Four Corners place. And I do believe they've met there before for custody exchanges. It wasn't like a new place that she was lured to or something, right? Now, this is at the intersection of Highway 95 and US 64 West, a location in Texas County, Oklahoma. Butler and Kelly left Hugerton, Kansas, and traveled to Highway 95 and Rhode Island about five miles north of Four Corners. Butler and Kelly arrived at that location at approximately 9.40 hours. So they didn't make it to the meeting spot, huh? That's sure. That is what they said. Wow, okay. Butler planned to bring her daughter to a birthday party. It was also her daughter's sixth birthday that day. She planned to bring her daughter to a birthday party, but after they did not arrive, the family began looking for Butler. Of course, it would have been an exciting day to bring the kids, you know, to collect them, take them to this birthday party, which I think would have been her daughter's actual sixth birthday party. And I'm sure a lot of planning went into it. That is devastating. Melissa and Joey Padilla, who are Butler's family members, located Butler's abandoned vehicle just west of the intersection of Highway 95. So it's family members who located the vehicle. So they must have gotten in their car and thought... Why are they not here at this birthday party? This is very suspicious. So they jumped in their car and probably drove there because they were the ones to find the vehicle. We don't know that yet either, right? We only thought, we actually thought it was the Texas State Highway, Texas Highway State Patrol. Hope I'm saying that in the right order. I thought it was them. But they said Melissa and Joey were Butler's family, located Butler's abandoned vehicle just west of the intersection of Highway 95 and Road L. The Padillas then contacted law enforcement at 12.09 hours. An examination of the vehicle and surrounding the area surrounding the vehicle found evidence of a severe injury. Okay, blood was found on the roadway and edge of the roadway. Butler's glasses were also found in the roadway south of the vehicle near a broken hammer. So that's also true. You know, there's little bits that we've heard along the way, bits of rumors and things when people said maybe was the glass smashed, was there a hammer? People said yes, people said no. Here they say it, okay, so at least that one's been clarified, near a broken hammer. Oh dear. A pistol magazine was found inside Kelly's purse at the scene, but no pistol was found. Adams told OSBI that on Friday night, now here comes a nice lie. Are ready? The grandmother told OSBI that on Friday night, March 29th of 2024, Rickman and Butler's children stayed the night with Barrett and Lacey Cook. Don't know who they are, but okay, friends. Adams said that she planned to pick them up that morning before visitation. Adams said that she called Butler, so the grandmother called Veronica Butler at 9 o'clock in the morning on that Saturday to confirm the meeting. Here comes the lie. And Butler told Adams that something came up and she wasn't going to make it. You're right. That's a big lie. In my, right? Am I right? Am I reading this right? That's a big lie. Because obviously Veronica would want to pick up her children. She was even fighting for more visitation time. She said they owed her lots, like weeks, like something like eight weeks worth of visitation time. She'd missed out on a whole lot, and it was her daughter's birthday. So, with Tiffany Adams, the grandmother, pretending like, no, she said she wasn't going to make it. Like, okay. So, uh, what do you think when they find the car, her glasses, and all this? Like, these criminals are so dumb, and we like it that way. Yeah, I keep being dumb. So, they said, uh, Butler's, okay, Butler's phone records confirmed that the call occurred. However, at the time of the call, Butler was in Hugerton, Kansas, in the process of picking Kelly up to meet Adams. Adams said that she was home at the time that Butler and Kelly went missing. Oh, uh, was she now? Adams picked the children up before noon, before 12 o'clock, from the Cook's residence. OSBI interviewed Brune. Now, that's the, that Cheryl lady that Tiffany Adams, the grandmother, wanted to supervise the visits, right? Okay, so OSBI interviewed Brune and said that she was, a, and said, and she said that she was available to supervise the visit that day. Clearing up those lies of Tiffany Adams, but that Adams told her to take a couple of weeks off from visitation so that Adams could question the children. Wow, related to how Butler's approved visitation supervisors were. Damn, that lady can lie. Okay, so Butler and 
Kelly's phone records indicate that their devices were actively sending signals to their carriers until approximately 9.42 hours, after which the devices were no longer seen by the networks and stopped transmitting. Neither phone was found at the scene or within the vehicle, and they are currently missing. That's what I was wondering about. It's one of my questions that I initially wrote down. Like, what about their phones? <laughs> you know, what happened? I haven't found them. Mm hmm Okay, so I hope that you are uh, learning some more details here. Yes, indeed. So phones haven't found them. Adams, the grandmother, was the last known person to communicate with Butler. Giant red flag. And was scheduled to meet Butler and Kelly for visitation at 10 hundred hours, so 10 o'clock in the morning on March 30th of 2024. Through the child custody case, recordings were obtained where Rickman discussed death threats by Adams. Wrangler Rickman is her son. He discussed death threats by Adams and Adams' boyfriend, Tad Cullum. The custody battle began in February of 2019 with many hearings and court appearances. On March 18th of 2024 and March 20th of 2024, motions were filed requesting extended visitation for Butler. A hearing was scheduled to occur. Listen, my voice better last. Better work with me voice. Hold on. Listen, we're not getting Krzyzewski flu over here. <laughs> okay, I'll read a little softer. Put my pilot voice on so that my voice can last. Okay, so we go back to the custody battle. A hearing was scheduled to occur on April 17th of 2024. Butler's attorney informed OSBI that Butler was likely to receive unsupervised visitation with her children at that hearing. At times, Adams refused to let Rickman have his children. We talked about that yesterday as well. That was rumored. Now it's confirmed. This grandmother was so possessive over the kids, she wouldn't even let her own son see the kids. Oh, yes. Okay. Even though Rickman had legal custody of them, law enforcement previously responded to a call for service where Adams refused to give Rickman his children. Reportedly, the officer told Rickman that he believed the children were better off in Adams's care. The officer told Rickman that he believed. Interesting. One more time. Law enforcement previously responded to a call for service where the grandmother refused to give Rickman his children. Reportedly, the officer told Rickman that he believed the children were better off in Adam's care. That is implying that, as speculated, you know, online, that this Tiffany Adams feels quite invincible and may actually have law enforcement connections, is what people were saying online. It seems like if she's like, don't worry, like they're way better off with me. She's telling them stories, right? I mean, maybe they were at a time, but um, yeah, now, look what you did, Granny. Sure. Thank you, Ali B from Tennessee, for being a member for a year. Okay, so Rickman's grandmother. So Rickman's grandmother. I don't know if that's on his dad's side or mother's side, but Debbie Knox Davis reported that in mid to late February of 2024, Rickman told her that they didn't... Oh, this is hectic. Okay, now Rickman is the father of the children, Veronica's ex. Okay, are we following? And Tiffany, the grandmother, the, the grandmother's son. When I say grandmother, it's grandmother of, ch of the children, right? Okay. Rickman's grandmother, Debbie Knox Davis, reported that in mid to late February of 2024, Rickman told her that they didn't have to worry about the custody battle much longer because Adams, the grandmother, had it under control. That Adams knew the path the judge walked to work and we will take out Veronica at drop-off. Okay. Very interesting. Right. Wait, I think some of you need a visual. <laughs> People are getting confused. So when they say Butler, they're talking about Veronica Butler. Okay. She has children, two children, with Wrangler Rickman. She was taking Jillian Kelly along. Jillian was supervising the visit. Okay. So we've got that. Let's quickly go here to the mugshots. When they say Adams, they're talking about Granny over here. Boyfriend is Tad. Grandmother and Tad were giving death threats to her own son because she wanted to have the children so badly. Those other two in the bottom, they are just dodgy ass friends by the sounds of it. 
who are also charged with first degree murder, two counts, and kidnapping and conspiracy to commit murder. So visuals, okay? This, when they say R uh, Rickman is the, the son of the granny, Adams, Tiffany Adams, okay? I keep on saying it in the chat. If anybody's watching the replay and you're annoyed by that, watch the chat replay and you'll see it's necessary. We've got to do these visuals. We've got to explain, okay? So this is the son, which is Veronica on the right-hand side's ex. They have two children together. In the middle of this battle is that freaking mother, Tiffany Adams. And she's there, sitting there with the two children. I blurred out their faces, okay, to protect them. You can see them online, though. If you go on Facebook, all these people have public Facebook profiles, and you can see it. So that granny was like, these children are mine. She won't let her son see the children. She won't let Veronica see the children. And she brags that, don't worry, the custody battle won't go on too much longer because I know the path of the judge walks. And we'll just take Veronica out at drop-off? I mean, what does that even mean? Take Veronica out at drop-off. So here we go. We've got Veronica on the right-hand side, Tiffany Adams, the custody battle that we're talking about now. Here is again. What a glow down. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Damn. There's Tiffany Adams, the grandmother with boyfriend. Both of them arrested. Okay. Now, let me just put this here in case you guys need it a little bit. Okay. So we are. We are here. So Rickman, this lady's son, right? Father of the children. Rickman's grandmother. We don't have a picture of her. Debbie Knox Davis reported that in mid to late February. So listen to the time. Mid to late February of 2024. Rickman told her that they didn't have to worry about the custody battle much longer because Adams had it under control and that Adams knew the path that the judge walked to work and said, we will take out Veronica at drop-off. Rickman, the granny son, confirmed. He was confirmed to be in a rehabilitation facility in Oklahoma City at the time of the disappearance. The children remain in the custody of Adams. Obviously not now. <laughs> When they say remain, remained, we could say remained, because not now. Rickman denied having that conversation with Knox. So it's the grandmother that says it. Now, why would the grandmother lie? Why would the grandmother lie? It sounds like the grandmother's telling on possibly her own daughter, or if it's her daughter-in-law, I'm not sure. Okay? So we continue. They say, on April 1st of 2024, so this is after the murders. The murders, according to the timeline, happened on March 30th of 2024. The car was found on March 30th as well. And then there was a lot of silence. And then there was suddenly SWAT teams deployed on April 13th. And here we are, a day after the press conference and everything. Bodies were found yesterday, two bodies. And formal identification is still happening. Now, on April 1st of 2024, OSBI agents obtained a search warrant for Adam's cellular phone. That's this lady right there at the bottom, right? For her cell phone. OSBI agents performed an extraction on the device. So we do like that. We do like that. Okay, do that. Yes, find out what she Googled. Information gained from the device included. Here we go. Uncle Google's going to tell on you, lady. Mm-hmm. Okay. The, these two pictured right here. Okay, the grandmother. Here's what Uncle Google saw. Included web searches for taser pain level, gun shops, prepaid cellular phones, and... How to get someone out of their house. Okay, then. Very interesting. On April 3rd of 2024, OSBI interviewed CW, age 16 years. Now, CW is the daughter of Cora Twombly and Kobe White. Okay, now let's go like this. Go back to this mugshot. There we go. These are the mugshots. Cora Twombly is on the right-hand side at the bottom. Okay, just one more time here. So we've got the grandmother, Tiffany Adams, her boyfriend, Tad Cullum. These two friends that own some kind of a butchery or a farm, a farm and butchery, Cole Twombly and Cora Twombly. So they're saying here that on April 3rd, the OSBI interviewed CW aged 16 years, so that thankfully they uh, redacted that. CW is the daughter of Cora Twombly and Kobe White. So that's obviously Cora's daughter, but not the biological daughter of Cole, is what I'm understanding. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Cora is married to Cole Twombly, the two pictured bottom right. They married to each other. I knew that they were in a relationship for over eight years. I didn't know they were married, though. So that's new to me because I wasn't sure. I was trying to confirm. Are they married? They do have the same surname. When did they get married or are they just, you know, 
saying their names are the same. Remember, these are sovereign citizens. So, Okay, uh, Ellie B from Tennessee says, Thank you for the visuals. It helps my ADHD brain. My pleasure. Okay, so... CW is the daughter of Cora and Kobe White. Cora is married to Cole Twombly. CW stated that she had over group, overheard group conversations related to Butler, that's Veronica Butler, one of the victims, the mother of the children, right? Not protecting her children from her brother, in, all in reference to a sexual abuse allegation. So that one makes me a little uncomfortable because I don't know if that's true or not. You know, that's major allegations saying that Veronica's brother sexually abused her children and that Okay, according to court records, they say that Veronica wasn't supposed to have her children near her brother, but continued to. He was allowed to still be around them. So that was an issue, but I don't know if that's true or not. If it is, that's very sad. Oh my goodness. CW advised, now that's the daughter of Cora, bottom right. CW advised that she was told by Cora that Adams, that's the grandmother. Cullum, that's the boyfriend of the grandmother. Cora and Cole pictured on the bottom and some guy called Paul Grice, we haven't heard of him before, uh, were involved in the deaths of Butler and Kelly. She stated that Adams, the grandmother, Tiffany Adams, had provided burner phones. <laughs> it's like we've already got Google searches, now we've got burner phones. She stated, so the Cora's daughter says that this granny right here provided burner phones to use so they could communicate with without using their personal devices. CW saw two burner phones charging on Cora's nightstand in her bedroom. CW described Cora, Cole, Adams, Cullum, so that's the four that were arrested, and then this other dude, Paul Grice, as being part of an anti-government group that had a religious affiliation. Through OSBI investigation, it was learnt that they call their group God's Misfits. Regular meetings are held weekly at Twombly's and at and the home of Barrett and Lacey Cook. The friends, I don't know who they are either. So weekly, regular meetings are held weekly at the Twombly's home, the bottom two there, and this other home where the grandmother said the children were overnight on the Friday night. Okay? I hope it's making sense. So CW was told on March 29th, which was a Friday, 2024, that Cora and Cole would not be home in the morning when she worked and we're going to be on a mission. Oh my. Okay. So Cora told her daughter, when you wake up, we're not going to be here, okay? Because we're going on a mission. She's like, what the hell? Okay, so when CW awoke at approximately 10 that morning on Saturday, March 30th, Cora and Cole were not home. But they came home, they came home around noon. CW knew that Cole and Cora took a blue and gray Chevrolet pickup owned by them and a blue flatbed pickup owned by Clint Twombly when they left and returned in the same vehicles. So they each took a vehicle. CW was told, oh my word, so these, those two at the bottom there, they get back home, right? The, all four of them are involved in this allegedly, all facing first degree murder charges, first degree kidnapping and conspiracy to commit murder. This is also a death penalty state, so good luck to them. Are they going to get the death penalty? Today, the, the, the OSBI uh, main dude said he's not sure yet if they will or not. That would be up to the district attorney. You know, they have to ask um, the district attorney or the state prosecutor. They didn't clarify, but I'm sure they will, right? Okay, so when they got home, those bottom two, they said to CW, the 16-year-old, okay, they say, go and clean the interior of the Chevrolet pickup. Wow. You get home after that and you ask your 16-year-old daughter to go clean the car? After what you allegedly just did? CW asked Cora what happened. So she asked her mother what happened and was told that things did not go as planned, but that they would not have to worry about Veronica Butler again. CW was told that Cora and Cole blocked the road to stop Butler and Kelly, and divert them to where Adams, Cullum, and Grice or Greece were. I was picture I was picturing that when we looked at the map time. Um, I was thinking, well, if they didn't make it all the way south to that meeting spot, maybe you know, 
these people stood in the road to like block them or maybe at least two of them because they also went in two vehicles. So it sounds like Cole was in one vehicle and Cora in another and maybe they blocked the road. And when they were trying to drive to the meeting spot, they're like, no, go that way, which would be the way towards this one's house, right? If you remember the map time a little bit. Okay, so they say Cole, uh, Cora and Cole blocked the road to stop Butler and Kelly to divert them to where? Adams, Cullum, so the grandmother, her boyfriend, and whoever Grease is or Grice were. C.W. asked about Kelly and why she had to die. And was told by Cora that she wasn't innocent either, as she had supported Butler. Shame. She was a court-appointed supervisor for these visits with Veronica's children. She's doing her job. She's pastor's wife. A mother of four. Going along. Responsible. Helping Veronica to not go alone, of course. She had to have a supervisor, and she was one of three court-appointed supervisors. What? So, wow. Cora saying she wasn't innocent either because uh, she had supported Butler. CW asked Cora if their bodies were put in a well. And Cora replied, something like that. Don't they sound lovely? My goodness. <laughs> Bad Jelly, the witch says, why do these people think they'll get away with this dumbassery? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I don't know why they think. Uh, thankfully, thankfully, they're so dumb. So, CW also disclosed that other attempts to kill Butler occurred during February of 2024 near Hugerton, Kansas, in which Adams, Cullum, her boyfriend, Cole Cora, and that other dude went to Hugerton, but Butler did not leave her residence. This is consistent with a web search discovered on Adams' phone about how to get someone out of their house. She literally Googled how to get to someone out of the house. <laughs> okay, then. According to Cora, the plan was to throw an anvil through Butler's windshield while driving, making it look like an accident because anvils regularly fall off work vehicles. Smart. <laughs> These people are so smart, aren't they? Okay, so while in... So there, there was already an attempted murder plan. There was already, wow, good luck to these people. Sure, the premeditation already dates back a month before anything even happened, right? So while in Carrick, Texas, interviewing C.W. and her brother, Cora and Cole arrived and tried to get access to C.W. and her brother. Cora was verbally aggressive, the lady bottom right. She was verbally aggressive and was very upset with your affiant that she was not granted access to C.W. and her brother, which would be her daughter and, I guess, son. Cole exited the vehicle, damn, okay, Cole down there, exited the vehicle, armed with a handgun in a holster on his belt. OSBI investigation showed that Adams searched for gun shops on her cell phone. This one. She searched for gun shops on her cellular phone. A search of local gun shops showed Adams buying five stun guns at the Big R store in how do I say that? Gaiman, Gimmon, Oklahoma. The purchase was made on March 23rd of 2024. Okay. And remember, it was on March. Ooh, I got to jog my memory here because it was March 22nd that I think uh, the father of the children was booked into that rehab facility. So I think it was on March 20th. Yes, correct. March 20th is when Veronica Butler filed a petition in court to have more visitation rights with her family. We heard that there was going to be from this, we, we read that there will be a hearing on April 17th. But to think of March 20th, for Veronica to be filing that formal petition to say, I want more rights with my children, more visitation rights, more time with them and all of that. And then on March 23rd, this unhinged lady, allegedly, is going to Google gun shops and then going there to buy five stun guns on March 23rd, just three days later, a day after her son is checked into rehab. OSBI investigation showed that Adams purchased three prepaid cellular phones from Walmart. Of course she did. <laughs> sorry, Walmart. I'm so sorry. You featured again. Okay. In, is there someone in chat that can help me with that? It's Guyman. Guyman? It's not Guyman, right? It's Guyman. Okay. Guyman, Oklahoma. On February 13th of 2024. Again, a lot of planning, huh? 
she purchased these burner phones or three prepaid, 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 prepaid cellular phones from Walmart in Guymon, Oklahoma on February 13th of 2024. The phones were identified by the phone numbers, so they've got them. I suppose I don't have to redact those. I was going to initially, but they burner phone numbers or the ones, the numbers of what she bought. Okay. Right. So search warrants for information related to location services and phone usage were completed for each device. It was learned that all three phones were at the area where Butler's car was located and the last known location of Butler and Kelly at the time of the disappearance. All three phones were powered on and accessed the cellular network for the first time at or near Cullum's residence at different times prior to March 30th. They were doing like practice rounds. Oh my gosh. On March 30th of 2024, phone numbers, that one and that one, before Butler and Kelly's disappearance were at the Twombly's residence prior to going to or near Cullum's residence. Butler and Kelly's disappearance at 10.05 and 10.16 hours, phone numbers, those ones and that one, were in the area at or near Cullum's residence. <laughs> John Doman says, not the smartest gang. Yeah, not the smartest gang at all. Let me just move this down a little bit. I hope you can still see nicely. Now, after Butler and Kelly's disappearance on March 30th, 2024, between 10.16 and 10.35 hours, it was determined that those phone numbers were at a property owned by Jamie Beasley. There's a lot of other names here, right? Below a dam. So there was this property owned by this person. Maybe they weren't even there, right? The phone numbers were there, below a dam, in the pasture where fresh dirt work was located by your affiant. Concrete was moved from a location near Beasley's residence approximately 150 to 200 yards below the dam, where it was discovered that a hole had been dug and filled back in and then covered with hay. Whoa. The location where Butler and Kelly disappeared from and where Butler's vehicle was located is approximately 8.5 miles away from the location below the dam on Beasley's property giving drive time from the location of where Butler's vehicle was located to Beasley's property well within the 34 minutes between the time of Butler or Kelly's phone stopping transmission and the prepaid phone numbers arriving at the dam on Beasley's property. All prepaid phones stopped transmitting on the morning of March 30th of 2024 at locations near Twombly's residence and Beasley's property. <laughs> Petra says, my goodness, where are their brains? <laughs> Thank goodness they don't have them. Okay. AC is like, document time. I know, right? We love documents. Okay. So Beasley advised that the dirt work was done with a skid steer by Cullum. See him there? Top right. On March 29th, the day before, 2024, and was possibly finished on March 30th, 2024 in the morning hours. Beasley knew that Cullum left his skid steer on his property the night of March 29th of 2024. And when he awoke on March 30th, at approximately 1,200 hours, the skid steer was gone. Cullum rents the pasture property owned by Beasley for cattle grazing and has access to it at any time. Using a friend's property. Mm. On March 28th or 29th of 2024, Cullum, pictured there, you can see him, right? Okay. Cullum asked Beasley if he could cut a tree down, remove a stump, bury some concrete, do dirt work where the concrete pile was, and below the dam. Adams was with Cullum at Beasley's property when that conversation was had. In a contact with Cullum, your affiant learned from Cullum that Adams is his significant other. Ooh, they Facebook official, you guys. Uh, Beasley agreed to allow Cullum to do the work. Cullum brought up the idea of doing the work to Beasley. Okay, that work sounds a little bit suspicious. He's like, hey, can I, uh, you know the property I always have access to? Do you mind if I cut a tree down, remove a stem, bury some concrete, do some dirt work where this concrete pile is below the dam? And he's like, sure. Like what? Bury some concrete. Okay, if you ever have anyone asking, hey, do you mind if I dig in your backyard and just bury some concrete? I think that that's a red flag, okay? It's a red flag. Wow. So 
They said uh, Beasley agreed to allow Cullum to do the work. Cullum brought up the idea of doing the work to Beasley. On Sunday, March 31st of 2024, in the morning hours, Cullum was at Beasley's house and told Beasley that people were looking at him for the at him. <laughs> so wait, wait. Cullum was at Beasley's house and told Beasley that people were looking at him for the disappearance of Butler and Kelly. Cullum told Beasley that he didn't want the police or people to cause problems for Beasley and said that all the skid uh, steer tracks on his property without a skid steer looked bad. He's like, bro, don't you worry about that buried concrete. But those uh, marks, the tracks, mm, yeah, the skid marks, <laughs> skid steer tracks on the property, they look bad, okay, without that skid steer there. So Beasley said that if anyone asked, he would tell them that Cullum had done tree and dirt work for him. Don't do that. Don't cover for your shady-ass friends. Robin, thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. So, wherefore, affiant praise this court to issue a warrant for the arrest of, within the name defendant, that he or she may be brought before magistrate and held to answer for the offences of murder in the first degree, two counts, two counts of kidnapping and one count of conspiracy. Uh, conspiracy. Carla says, mind if I do some landscaping? I know, right? It's like, hey, do you mind if I just, like, go to your pasture and just bury some concrete? Sure, buddy, no problem. What? So all of them have, all of these four suspects you see on the screen here, have got the same charges, okay? Uh, I might actually have to take this presentation off now. So you can see this one is for Tad, Bert, Cullum. Murder in the first degree, murder in the first degree, kidnapping, kidnapping, conspiracy. They all have that. Here's this Tiffany Adams one as well. She's got it too. What is this one? Uh, by the way, they're all going to be in, in court to be arraigned on the 17th, which is Wednesday. Today's Monday, right? Yeah. On the 17th, which is Wednesday. Same here. This is the Twombly dude. There he is as well. Same. It's the same PCA. Same probable cause affidavit, as you can see. There's some witnesses listed there. I don't know if I should be showing that. I'm not sure. But if you look here, murder in the first degree, deliberate intent. So we should actually read one of these. Um, yeah, let's read a Twombly one. They're all the same. Okay, count one, murder in the first degree, deliberate intent, a felony. Uh, count two, murder in the first degree, deliberate intent, also a felony. Kidnapping, a felony. Kidnapping, a felony. And count five is conspiracy to commit murder in the first degree, deliberate intent. Okay? Yeah. Alicia says, OMG, can't wait to see this arraignment. Can you imagine? I wonder if they'll stream it or anything like that. I don't know. If you see it out there, send it to me. I'll also be, you know, keeping my eyes wide open to see if we can see it or if we hear about them doing it. But they don't always show us i hope they do though i hope they do four idiots in a courtroom okay so uh this says state of oklahoma county of texas i george h leach the third we heard from him today district attorney the undersigned at the press conference if you missed it right the undersigned district attorney of said county in the name and by authority of the state of oklahoma give information that in said county of texas and the state of oklahoma Cora, Gail, Twombly did then and there lawful, unlawfully, willfully, knowingly and wrongfully commit the crimes of count one, murder in the first degree, deliberate intent, a felony. So we're going to read some of this just so we get some details here of what they're charging them all with. Um, this is now Cora's one, but as we know, uh, Tiffany Adams, Tad Cullum, Cora and Cole Twombly, all the same. Okay, so they say uh, murder in the first degree, Deliberate intent of felony by aiding and abetting in the commission of the deliberate and intentional taking away of the life of a human being on or about the 30th day of March 2024, and then and they willfully, unlawfully, and feloniously, without authority of the law, aid and abet in the death of Veronica Butler, who was lured to the location of Highway 95 and Road L in Texas County, Oklahoma, and certain mortal wounds were inflicted, and Veronica Butler did in fact die as a result of the wounds inflicted. The crime is punishable by death, imprisonment for life, or imprisonment for life without parole. Mm -hmm. Count two, murder in the first degree, by aiding and abetting in the commission. Same wording, of course, and it's just different um, for the second victim's name. Aid and abet in the death of Jillian Kelly, who was lured to the location of Highway 95 and Road L in Texas County, Oklahoma, and certain mortal wounds were inflicted on Jillian Kelly, did in fact die as a result of the wounds inflicted. The crime is punishable by death, imprisonment for life, or imprisonment for life without parole. So the thing is that, of course, identifying the bodies and everything, and wow, they found them obviously with the cell phone data, right? The cell phone pings and things. 
But it sounds like they were buried in concrete, which is going to take a while then to, to work on that. Count three, kidnapping a felony on or about the 30th day of March uh, 2024 by aiding and abetting the forcible seizing of Veronica Butler from Highway 95 and Road L, the county of Texas, Oklahoma, and confining Veronica Butler in another vehicle and transferring said victim to another location. Okay, so here they say confining Veronica Butler in another vehicle and transferring said victim to another location without lawful authority and with the intent to cause Veronica Butler to be confined or imprisoned against her will. And same here as well, Jillian Kelly, confining her in another vehicle and transferring said victim to another location without lawful authority and with the intent to cause Jillian Kelly to be confined or imprisoned against her will. The crime is punishable by imprisonment for not more than 20 years. So the other two, that could be the death penalty already, or a life without parole, or life imprisonment. So imagine all these charges, everything just stacked up, right? Another kid, so two kidnapping, two first degree mur uh, murder charges, and then conspiracy to commit murder in the first degree says uh, deliberate intent, a felony, by conspiring and agreeing with Tad Cullum, Tiffany Adams, and Cole Twombly to commit the crime of murder in the first degree, a felony, on or about between the 13th day of February, that's when she was buying the stun guns, 2024, she being the grandmother, and the 30th day of March. 2024, by arranging and planning the deliberate, intentional, and unlawful taking away of the life of Veronica Butler and or Gillian Kelly, and the defendant and or co-conspirators did purchase burner phones, stun guns, and travel to the area of Highway 95 and Road L, County of Texas, Oklahoma, in the furtherance of the conspiracy. The crime is punishable by imprisonment of not more than 10 years, or a fine of not more than $5,000, or by both such fine and imprisonment. Darlene Weaver says, hope they don't get a scared-ass judge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope not. Hope they're not besties with a judge or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I like to have hope that there's going to be full justice for Veronica Butler and Gillian Kelly. These are the victims. Shame. And all they were doing, all they wanted, Veronica just wanted to see her kids, age six and eight. And Jillian was just accompanying her on this supervised visit with her kids. They were going to pick them up and take them to a birthday party because her daughter just turned six that day. And if you do go on Facebook, shame. Her kids are just so sweet, you know, so sweet looking, so happy on the pictures. I feel so terrible for them. And Jillian was also a wife of a pastor and a mother of four who was working as a secretary at the church that her husband was a pastor at. He just opened another church in Nebraska. Uh, one was in the Hugerton area in Kansas. And she was running the children's program as well. She sounds like a lovely lady. My goodness. So now I quickly want to show you. So I think that's it for the documents. Let me just make, a sh make sure here. Here's this one for Tiffany Adams. Let me just quickly check here. Yeah, those are all the same charges. So they were driving from Hugerton in Kansas to this meetup point in Oklahoma. I'm gonna zoom in there now, we're gonna put the Google man down in a moment. This place that's called Keys is the property of Tiffany, the grandmother, okay? Tiffany Adams, here's the property. I do not know where the Beasley's property is or the dam or anything like that. That I'm not sure yet. I would have to actually do like background checks and things and I don't know if we could share that right now. This is where Tad Cullum stays stayed he now stays in jail <laughs> okay and so with big big charges what else was i mapping out here what is this one oh yeah that was where the son the son is at the salvation army rehab okay so one more time if we go in here this is where they were supposed to be meeting up at this four corners area but where they ended up being as we can hear it sounds like cora and cole twombly were in their vehicles blocking this road here okay so put the google man here put him stefan are you warning people <laughs> so the car was found off a thousand feet off the road off the main road on this dirt road so if we just look around my goodness can you imagine if they're just driving towards that area let me see if i'm pointing in the right direction <laughs> sure uh yeah, I think they were driving this way. 
just driving along, waiting to go meet up at the meeting point, which they'd been at before. And Veronica must have been so excited to see her kids. And then there's like, I would just imagine two cars, just, just, nope, go another way. Just go the other way, right? Which sounded like, if I remember correctly, they were uh, led to go towards Granny's house, which is over here. Which I looked earlier, between the two would be about a 20 minute drive or so. But sounds like they went to the Beasley's property, which I don't know exactly where that is. They talk about 8.5 miles, don't know the exact property address. But wow, what an area. So rural and amazing that these criminals are so dumb that police were able to locate their bodies. I mean, it sounds like they had dug a hole, as in Tad, Cullum, and Tiffany Adam, and then and then filled it with concrete after. Like, that is very scary. Oh, my goodness. They probably thought, nah, they'll never find them. Not out here. And I don't know. It sounds to me like the granny thought she had a lot of influence, right, over the police. Like, don't you worry. We could just get away with anything. Like, no, not really. Okay. So that's what we have for now. Thank you so much to Grizzly Cat for calling, literally picking up the phone and calling the court clerk there. You know, I was like looking at all the links that everyone had sent me on email, like, where are these documents? <laughs> but thank you so much, Grizzly Cat, for calling the court clerk and actually obtaining these documents for us. Um, yeah, they were not free, and that's okay. Don't worry, I have made sure to, to cover all the costs and say thank you to Grizzly Cat as well, on behalf of all of us. So thank you so much. And so that's it for now. So the next thing that happens is on Wednesday, the 17th, they will be arraigned. Let me just quickly see if there's a time because... Mary had sent me some lovely information. There we go. 9.30 a.m. initial appearance. 9.30 a.m. on the 17th. Obviously, that's local time. So if you're like, what time is it? Just calculate it for Oklahoma time, which is central time, right? Yeah, I had to do all those calculations earlier for the press conference. Okay, so I hope that you learned a lot more information from that about this case. We'll continue to follow it. We'll see what happens next beyond the arraignment. When's the trial date? I mean, that could take a while. Is anyone going to turn on each other? Is someone going to plead? What's going to happen? I don't know. We'll take it from here. Thank you so much. Please leave your comments below. I can't wait to read them as well. Again, apologies for the little delay in the beginning there if you were here waiting for the live stream. And I, uh, yeah, <laughs> Mark says, we'll be back Wednesday, 7 a.m. <laughs> it's at 9.30, the initial appearance. If you see a link for that arraignment, please send it to me or if you, if you hear about it because they don't always show it, but I really hope they do. Do they have cameras there in the courtroom, huh, in Oklahoma? I hope so. Okay. And I hope, yeah, if you ask, what can we learn from this? Many things. If you're going to meet, if there's a, you know, tension with family members, especially custody battles, we see so many cases like that where it turns into murder cases. Make sure you meet in a place. We're not victim blaming. It's just, what can we learn? That has cameras, a public place. I know that where they were going, whether it was the granny's house or anywhere they're going to meet would have been pretty out there in the middle of nowhere. But try meet where there's cameras or a safe place. And if the granny doesn't want to the granny should have gone to her, you know what I mean? Oh, just so annoying. And then other than that, yeah, if your friend is asking you, can I just like dig a hole and put some concrete in it? Uh, no. The answer is no. Okay. Many lessons. Okay. I will see you all again very soon. If you didn't see the press conference earlier, I've defluffed it for you. So it's only 30 minutes long. You could catch up very quickly, especially if you watch it like 1.5 speed or whatever. Okay. So I will see you soon. Thank you, Mods. Really appreciate it. And stay safe.